1949, a new word entered the English lexicon from the Union of South Africa. The country, which was already dominated by an explicitly racialist law code, took an even harsher turn towards racial oppression. The far-right National Party won the majority of seats in the country's parliament in the 1948 election, becoming the governing body for the first time and pushing South Africa towards an even more radical vision of a racially oppressive future. For those unfamiliar with the system, apartheid, as it would come to be known, means apartness in Afrikaans, and it was a system of racialized government that acted as the governing principle of South Africa throughout the mid to late 20th century. The system sought to maintain the power of the country's white minority, particularly those that were descendants of Dutch settlers called Afrikaners, over the majority black population. In 1950, the new National Party government passed laws registering every South African under an explicit racial classification. If you lived in South Africa, you now had paperwork stating if you were white, black, colored, meaning mixed race, or Asian, and limiting their political rights and access to land, employment, education, and public services, depending on where your classification placed you. But arguably, the most radical apartheid policy of them all was one which had its origins long before the victory of the National Party in 1948. And this was the creation of the Homelands. The Homelands had their origins in the 1913 Native Lands Act. This act created a series of land reserves, in big quotes there. Tracts of land comprising a bit under 10% of the country, where black Africans were allowed to buy land. Black Africans who owned land outside of the reserves were allowed to keep it for now, but were prohibited from buying any new land from non-black landowners. The 1913 law had sought to gradually limit black land ownership solely to these small reserves through multiple generations, but this process proved frustratingly slow for the National Party. By 1948, there was still a fairly sizable number of black Africans holding land within the non-reserve regions of South Africa something which the National Party could not bear to allow. The solution, in the eyes of many apartheid supporters, was a simple one. It wasn't enough for white people and black people to be separated within one society, but rather, each racial caste would need their entirely separate state. This proposed separate state for black South Africans would soon receive a working name, inspired by the then-recent partitioning of the British colony on the Indian subcontinent into a majority Hindu state, India, and a majority Muslim state, Pakistan. And so, South Africa, it was believed, could similarly partition itself along racial lines, with a white South Africa and Bantustan. Ultimately, the plan would come to fruition, but not in the exact way its early proponents had envisioned. The idea of a united black African state composing a large chunk of South Africa proved impractical for the apartheid regime, and so they instead opted to create a series of semi-independent autonomous zones with the 1951 Bantu Authorities Act. So there never was a Bantu stan, but rather several Bantu stands, with each one purporting to represent an African ethnicity within the country of South Africa. Black South Africans living outside of the Bantu stands were forcibly evicted from their land, and forced to live within the Bantustan's frontiers or in low-quality segregated housing in major urban centers that they didn't own. South Africa even officially planned to release these Bantustans as ostensibly independent countries, and it actually did, though this was a farce, as South Africa still tightly controlled life within these ostensibly independent states, and not a single other country on Earth ever recognized them as independent. While the apartheid government framed the Bantu stands as a form of black self-determination and independence, this couldn't be further from the truth. A tiny class of black South African collaborators were rewarded with newfound power within the autonomous territories, but the main effect of the Bantu stands was instead to further isolate and marginalize black South Africans. Prior to 1951, they had been second-class citizens within South Africa. Now, they were non-citizens. Since they were technically only citizens of the Bantu stand, Black South Africans within the country were now treated as foreign workers residing in South Africa. With their movement in and out of Bantu stands, as well as job opportunities and educational opportunities, becoming more restricted than ever. While the tragic history of apartheid and Bantu stand system is certainly morbidly interesting, 
However, there's one element of the story that is easily overlooked in the grander narrative. That word, Bantu, is all over apartheid legislation. Of course, you can recognize it in the word Bantustan and in the Bantu Authorities Act, but also in the case of the Bantu Education Act, Promotion of Bantu Self-Governance Act, Bantu Investment Corporation Act, Urban Bantu Councils Act, and Bantu Citizenship Act, just to name a few. But of course, the use of this term in an apartheid context is far from its origin nor primary use today. The word Bantu continues to be used today in the field of linguistics, anthropology, history, political science, economics, and much, much more. In fact, if I had to hazard a guess, I would assume that the term Bantu might be the single most ubiquitous term in the entire academic study of African histories and cultures. It may surprise you, then, to know that the most ubiquitous term in the study of Africa is also one of its most controversial, even without consideration of its heavy use under apartheid. But I'm sure that at least a few of you are unfamiliar with the term and are eagerly awaiting for me to actually tell you what Bantu, you know, means after inundating you with such a deluge of context. But, well, that's where the controversy lies. What exactly Bantu means can change dramatically, depending on your point of view. Is Bantu merely the name of a linguistic group? Or is it much more than that? A culture? A group of people with shared genetics and ancestry, maybe? And most controversially of all, where did the Bantu-speaking peoples come from? How do these intense and heavily debated questions of Bantu origins continue to play into this controversy to this day? Today, for this season's transition episode, we'll get into the dirty weeds of historiography and attempt to answer the first question that you need to understand the further controversies surrounding Bantu identity and linguistics. And that is, where did the idea of Bantu even come from? Hello everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Today we will begin a two-part series on the historiography of the Bantu, one of Africa's largest linguistic and, maybe, cultural units. Though, that's a question for a later episode. For our first part today, we're going to focus on the historical origins of the term Bantu, where it came from, and how it became the name of one of the largest linguistic groups on Earth. Part 1. Who invented the term Bantu? The story begins with the recognition of language. Human beings are particularly good at pattern recognition, and of course this implies to the way we speak as well. You don't need a doctorate in linguistics to hear two separate languages and recognize the similarities and differences between them, and from there determine whether you think they are somewhat similar, demonstrably distinct, or, well, somewhere in between. When European merchants began making substantial contact with the civilizations and societies of Central and Southern Africa, they too noticed similarities in local languages to each other. Similarities that were undoubtedly very familiar to the speakers themselves. For example, it seems very likely that at any given moment a speaker of Matebele, for example, a language spoken in southern Zimbabwe, could have easily perceived that their language was very similar to, say, southern Ndebele, a language spoken just across the Limpopo River in the northern regions of South Africa. Perhaps this hypothetical person would have thought of them as two separate languages, or maybe they wouldn't have, and thought of it more in terms of, hey, those people to my south speak a lot like I do, but a little weirdly. These two languages are so close together that the speaker of one can mostly understand the speaker of another, to the point where people still debate today whether they should even be considered separate languages at all. From there, this same Matabele speaker could have noticed that their language had some in common with other nearby languages, like, say, Nosa, but not to the same extent as Ndebele. And then from there, they could see that their language had some even vaguer and less apparent similarities with Shona, another nearby language, and that all of these local languages had a lot more in common with each other than those spoken by European and Arabs who traded in the region. Sadly, there is very little written evidence from the regions of Southern and Central Africa to begin with, and those that do exist were typically concerned with grander things than casual linguistic observations. But while there is little, there is one exception, the Kingdom of Congo. In the 16th century, the Kingdom of Congo, located mostly in modern Angola and a little bit in the modern Democratic Republic of the Congo, confusingly enough, 
experienced prolonged contact and cultural exchange with the European country of Portugal. Portuguese clergymen were thoroughly integrated into the local society, with the kingdom even officially converting to Roman Catholic Christianity at various points. One product of this missionary presence was the rare existence of written documents in the local Kikongo language, which provides an incredible opportunity to analyze the evolution of the Kikongo language, or, as it turns out, maybe Kikongo languages. Now, as I stated earlier, documents like these don't focus on casual linguistics. They focus on much grander narratives of religion and theology. But we still can use them to observe different changes over time that may point us in the direction of what people in the area thought of linguistic diversity. See, close analysis of these sources, their grammar and vocabulary, show that regional variation in the Kikongo language was at one point incredibly potent with Kikongo varying substantially from region to region and even from town to town. However, as each region remained under the control of a centralized Congo state for longer, this linguistic diversity started to slowly decline, with the Kikongo languages becoming more and more unified and formalized. While multiple dialects survived, they became more clearly intelligible and recognizable to other Kikongo dialects, eliminating locally unique vocabulary and grammatical quirks. We don't know how aware the elites of the Congo Kingdom were of this shift, but they at the very least definitely benefited from the linguistic centralization of the era, so it seems very unlikely to me that they wouldn't at least have been aware that it was going on. As the Congo Kingdom began to disintegrate in its later years of existence, the Kikongo language again diverged into multiple, more distinct dialects. Now, while Africans and probably Europeans too alike were very aware of linguistic similarities and diversities within the regions of the continent they lived and worked in, it wouldn't be until the 19th century that Southern and Central Africa's languages were studied in terms of a unified whole in a global context. The story of the academic study of Bantu linguistics truly begins in 1837, when the British academic and ethnologist James Cowles Pritchard published his book, a Physical Ethnography of the Races of Africa. This book would propose quite a few then quite novel ideas that would eventually gain traction. For example, the book contains the first serious speculation from a European that humanity may have actually originated in Africa. Pritchard was influenced by a growing field of study, one which would later give birth to the modern field that we call linguistics. In this period, there was a growing interest in how languages related to each other, with interest exploding after some European scholars proposed a grand family of languages, each interrelated to each other to varying degrees, which stretched from the Atlantic coast of Europe to the west, and parts of India and Pakistan to the east. These scholars demonstrated that, even across such a wide geographic and cultural area, that many different languages in fact shared this unique common origin, a long linguistic genealogy linking them all together, would end up influencing a great number of people to take up the field of study, including Pritchard himself. Pritchard was interested in searching for similar systems in other parts of the world. Through comparing the vocabulary of various languages in Southern and Central Africa, he reached an interesting conclusion. Barring one exception, he thought that each of the languages he studied seemed pretty clearly interconnected. To read the book, albeit slightly edited to remove some unnecessary and rather offensive language that our early 19th century European academic chose to include, quote, The preceding collections exhibit specimens of languages spoken in the most distant parts of Southern Africa. They may be considered as exemplifying, though by a brief specimen, the idioms of the whole African continent to the southward of the equator, except for the Khoikhoi dialects. The Swahili on the eastern coast near the river Joba, the Congo languages in the west, and the black peoples in the far south, occupied the extreme points of a great triangle. The instances of resemblance are sufficiently numerous to show undoubted proof of connection in all of these languages, but this proof of connection is of different extent in different instances. Pritchard's proposed great triangle of African languages would soon gain a name in western scholarly circles. In 1862, German anthropologist Wilhelm Blake decided to bestow a name upon the proposed linguistic family. Appropriately for an African language family, he chose an African name. 
From the Zulu language, he took the term Abantu, meaning people, a term with close analogs in almost every language in South and Central Africa. It was Blake's slightly misspelled version of the name, which would remain the ubiquitous label for the linguistic family covering Southern and Central Africa to this day, Bantu. In the late 19th century, as European colonial rule spread across the entirety of Southern and Central Africa, the academics of these colonial countries became increasingly invested and capable of studying African linguistics. In previous generations, the only Europeans who had really been interested in learning African languages were missionaries, who were usually only interested in learning and perfecting one local language in the area of their mission's activity so they could most effectively convert people. So while there was a small number of Europeans who could fluently speak a given African language, there were very few capable of speaking multiple, and therefore few who were capable of comparing them. Meanwhile, most of the European academics who were now taking an interest in African languages had basically no experience speaking or reading any of them. Rather, they had been educated in the very trendy study of the then recently deciphered Sumerian cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphs. This gave rise to what I like to call the wacky period of Bantu studies, where European scholars would promote all kinds of weird speculations about Bantu linguistic origins. I won't go too much into them, but it turns out that when you take European scholars who are familiar with only two languages, they tend to make a lot of connections between the two, even when they aren't there. This period was chock full of European scholars who have only ever worked with, say, Sumerian before, looking at, say, Swahili and going, hmm, I'm getting a lot of Sumerian vibes from this language. The same happened with scholars familiar with Egyptian, Sanskrit, Persian, Hebrew, and a whole bunch of other languages from outside of the region. Possibly not coincidentally, this also conveniently aligned with European ideas of white supremacy. Of course, the linguistic complexity of Bantu languages couldn't have been invented by Central and Southern Africans, so it must have been brought to them by some outside dynastic race of Sumerians, Egyptians, Indians, or Hebrews, who brought these complex ideas to these simple people. This much more advanced and superior race of civilizers taught these languages to the black Africans before, um, mysteriously vanishing for some reason. To be frank, the linguistic evidence for these assertions was incredibly sparse and spurious even at the time. And since that time, archaeological and linguistic evidence has further emerged to demolish these theories and place them where they belong, in the dustbin of anthropology. While there's still a great deal of variation in modern theory of Bantu origins, every theory on Bantu linguistic origins that is taken even remotely seriously places the origin of these languages firmly within some region of southern and central Africa. The wacky period of Bantu linguistics started to come to an end as Europe solidified its colonial rule over southern and central Africa. The growing European empires within these parts of Africa required administrators who would be able to communicate with multiple peoples whom the empire had conquered. Now, if you had asked members of, say, the British Parliament to collectively draw a portrait of their perfect, ideal colonial administrator, then they would have drawn a precise simulacrum of a man who would contribute significantly to the modern idea of Bantu history. This was Sir Harry Johnston, who, yeah, does have a kind of funny name, admittedly. Johnston came from wealthy parents and had a lengthy educational background. However, his place in history would change forever when he took a trip to the modern country of Angola. At a time when European imperialism on the continent was just beginning its expansion, Johnston found himself fascinated with how the Portuguese had been able to control large swaths of tropical Africa, something which at the time no other European country had yet to do. As he later recounted in a newspaper article, Quote, of all the European powers that rule in tropical Africa, none have pushed their influence so far as Portugal. And the Portuguese rule more by influence over the natives than by actual force. The garrisons in the interior range from perhaps 50 to 200 men, and these are nearly entirely native soldiers. This idea of colonizing through influence rather than force of arms would eventually morph into a notion of which Johnston would become an ardent defender of. He would argue that his fellow Europeans would find much more success colonizing Africa through cunning diplomacy and sly manipulation, rather than sole reliance on force of arms. 
Throughout the next several years of his life, Johnston would make further visits to other parts of the African continent. On one of these visits, Johnston would make a deep trip into the inland regions of Tanzania in the hopes of reaching Mount Kilimanjaro, recording dictionaries and grammar books for the languages he encountered along the way, while trying to negotiate treaties with local rulers in an ultimately failed attempt to turn the region into a British colony. Without fail, each of the languages he encountered were from the Bantu family, quite similar to other languages he had documented. That was until he began to reach the far north of Tanzania and encountered the Maasai. Unlike their southern neighbors, the Maasai people of northern Tanzania did not speak a Bantu language, and instead spoke a language that was, well, he had no idea. It certainly wasn't similar to the other Bantu languages, but it wasn't very similar to the languages of Somalia or Ethiopia either. While he had heard of non-Bantu languages in southern and central Africa before, notably the Khoikhoi of South Africa, his encounter with the Maasai in northern Tanzania would introduce an idea to Johnston that would quickly become an important element of European speculation about the origin of Bantu language. What if, in fact, the Bantu-speaking people were from a different part of Africa entirely, and were the descendants of an ancient, continent-wide invasion from within the interior of Africa? What if the Maasai and Khoikhoi were not strange and random outliers, but merely the last remnants of a culture which once had inhabited the whole of the southern part of Africa? As he would publish in his Kilimanjaro travel log, quote, Originally, there was little doubt. The primal Bantu language was a member of a little group of prefixed governed tongues developed somewhere in the heart of Africa. Circumstances gave the people who spoke it the opportunity of playing a great role in the unwritten African history. And the Bantus, at one time very likely an obscure and unimportant tribe, became the ruling and almost the exclusive race of southern tropical Africa, swallowing up, obliterating, absorbing the previous inhabitants of the land, and carrying their own form of language triumphantly from the Upper Nile to Natal, and from the River Tana to the east to Fernando Po in the west. But Johnston wasn't done yet. Not only did he assert that all Bantu people must have shared a common group of ancestors, who spread their cultural progeny throughout most of the southern and central regions, but he claimed to know exactly where they came from. Comparing Bantu vocabularies, he noticed something peculiar. That almost all Bantu languages shared a common word for the gray parrot, a beautiful bird whose habitat overlaps with very little of the territories of Bantu-speaking people. In fact, the only part of Africa where gray parrots and Bantu speakers coexist is in the very far north of the Congo and Cameroon. However, the Bantu languages produced numerous different words for animals they would have been far more familiar with. Animals that existed throughout southern and central Africa, like elephants, lions, and zebras. Therefore, he asserted, the ancestors of all Bantu peoples must have originated from a region with gray parrots, but that lacked lions, elephants, and zebras. That this vocabulary diversity must have come from the Bantu ancestors, all familiar with parrots, by the way, moving south and encountering these unfamiliar creatures independently, and therefore independently inventing new words for them. Therefore, through the process of elimination, the early Bantu must have come from either southern Nigeria or northern Cameroon, a region with gray parrots, but no zebras, elephants, or lions. And from there began a long trek south to occupy their new homes in the rest of the continent. After proposing this theory of Bantu migration, Johnston would end up having an extensive career of British colonial administration in modern Malawi, Zambia, and Uganda. He would utilize his linguistic skills in the exact way he had anticipated, making use of his strong ability to learn African languages to negotiate with and manipulate African elites into signing over sovereignty to British forces. Johnston's idea, however, of a great Bantu migration would forever radically alter the perceptions of what the idea of Bantu represented. No longer was Bantu simply the name of a linguistic family, but it was now a term to describe a race of people, people who shared a common ancestry, a common history, a common root culture, and a legacy of great conquest as well. Crucially, Johnston's theory also acknowledged that the Bantu languages were of Central African origin, just of a particular part of Central Africa. Almost immediately, 
Johnston's theory of a great Bantu migration took off and became the dominant theory of explanation for the existence of the Bantu linguistic family. In a sense, the Bantu invasion theory, as it would come to be called, is still the dominant explanation in global academia for the origin and spread of the Bantu language family. Johnston's original version of the hypothesis would soon acquire a growing number of critics, who, one by one, poked ever-expanding holes in certain elements of the story. We'll leave off today by noting something that you've probably already perceived about this episode. For a podcast that usually focuses on and prioritizes African viewpoints on the continent's history, this episode was unusually Eurocentric. Each development in the idea of the Bantu language family, from its conception and naming to the hypothesis on its origins, came from the minds of Europeans. Particularly Europeans directly invested in ideologically bolstering the system of colonialism spreading throughout the African continent. Perhaps the single largest challenge to this early European take on Bantu linguistics will come from the entry of African and anti-colonial scholars into the fields in question. Some will criticize the theory, while others will accept parts of it and seek to iterate on and refine it. So, join us in our second part of this special episode, as we learn about how the entry of African scholars into academia, as well as the exploitation of Bantu expansion theory by the apartheid governments of Southern Africa, contributed to changing perceptions of the origins and essence of the Bantu languages. By the way, before I leave off today, I wanted to share something with you guys. So, um, this episode, of course, is done as a celebration of the Patreon. At the end of each season, if we hit a certain goal of supporters, uh, which was 200 this time around, uh, we put up one of these special episodes at the end of the season. So if you want another special episode, which just like this one is chosen by votes on the Patreon, uh, all the Patreon supporters vote for it, then just uh, go to the Patreon page and hit support. It goes a long way in supporting the show. Um, but what I'm really here to announce is something new entirely, a completely new way to support the show. Um, so... Uh, this is kind of random, but in addition to podcasting and writing about history, I also am pretty good at 3D modeling. And one of the things that I like to do is 3D model historic African architecture. So several different landmarks that have featured prominently on this show at various points, whether that be the uh, steles of Aksum, or the uh, royal palace of the Asantehane, or soon one that I'm currently working on is the royal palace of... Uh, Madagascar, the uh, the Manjaka Miyadana. There are little physical 3D models that you can purchase, so you can have a little part of African history on your desk at work or decorating the shelves of your home. So if that sounds interesting to you, please go check them out. They are available on the storefront at Patreon. Uh, so if you want to support the show but in a bit of a different way, that's a great way to do so. Give you a little bit of a physical memorabilia. And it all comes with a little handwritten note from me saying thank you. So, uh, hope that you guys find that interesting, and thank you. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate it if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayofag Bamie, Dimitri, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebelavie, Pascal Mokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabudike, Sheuna Lorontimain, Kwajo Mankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Vincent Virgiani, Niti, Kitty, Tariq Beetleman, and Calvin J. Norris, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.